<laughs> Kia ora. <laughs> I see that we are live. Welcome everybody who's joining in. I'm going to give it a couple of minutes for people to uh, kind of come into our space. You'll see that a uh, a nice short poll has come up in, in your screen. It's really helpful for us if you do fill that out. So it is optional, but really helpful if you do. Okay, now we don't have uh, everybody who has joined in, we don't have you on the screen, so we just have our panelists. Uh, so I want to check in with Sean, who is organizing all of this, our fabulous person who's based in Auckland, uh, because I see that there are people in our group who might want to answer some questions for us. So just send me a message and let me know how that works. But anyway, kia ora everybody. No mai haramai ki tēnei Zoom. Uh, e pāna ki a mātou ngā hunga kahukura. Uh, o te motu. Uh, he karakia, uh, kia tau te mauri. Uh, whakataka te hau ki te uru. Whakataka te hau ki te tonga. Kia mā kina kina ki uta. Kia mā tara tara ki tai. E hia ki ana te atakura, he tio, he huka, he hauhu, tihei, mauri ora. I welcome everybody. Uh, ko Elizabeth Kerekere toko ingoa. Uh, he taka tāpu i au. <coughs> he mokopono o te tai rāwhiti ki te taha o toku pāpa. Ko whanau ākai, ko ngāti oni oni. Ko te aitanga mahaki, ko rongo whakāta me ngai tāo manuhiri. Uh, ki te taha o toku māma. Uh, no County Clear, me County Tipperary, ki Airangi. Uh, I always say I'm an artist, an activist, an auntie. And right now I'm an MP for the Green Party and love to invite you here. We are going talking submissions for the Pai Order Healthy Futures Bill. I would like to introduce you and we'll have the beautiful faces come up. Our two panelists, Zoe Spinks and Lane McLeod. So I'll pass, <clears throat> Aroha mai, I'll pass to Lane to introduce yourself. Kia ora e uh, I'm Lane McLeod, uh, my pronouns are they, he. Um, I am currently a Otago Uni student and I am studying a Bachelor of Medicine and Surgery. Um, I grew up in Tiano in rural Southland and have lived in the past four years in Otipoti, Dunedin, and have recently, about two weeks ago, moved to Wellington for the next three years of my degree, and I'm, I'm having a wonderful time so far. Um, I um, fit into this area through um, working um, with the Rainbow Otago Medical Students Association that formed this year. So we work with the Otago University in improving our rainbow um, medical education curriculum um, and sort of filling that space that um, paid staff don't fill at the moment um, and so that's sort of the lens that I come into this from and um, I'm currently doing a summer research project um, investigating the pathways for gender affirming hormone therapy in the Wellington region um, so that's my fun job for the day. Um, so I think, I think I've covered all the points I'll pass on to Zoe. 
Hi everyone, uh, called Zoe Tukulingawa. I am a member of the Rainbow Greens executive. I'm the membership secretary specifically. So if you've ever um, asked to join the Facebook group, I'm the one who um, might message you and say, do you accept the rules? Um, I'm also a communicator in my day job and um, I really love the Rainbow community and want to see us um, thrive as much as we can. Um, so my my place within this um, this quarter this evening um, is to talk about how you can effectively make a submission and um, talk through like the, the process a little bit. Um, I've been quite involved in um, the last two big submissions for uh, conversion practices and births, deaths, marriages, registration, sorry, the relationship registration bill. There we go, we'll get it eventually. Um, so I'm not a health expert by any means, but I am a great communicator. Um, so I'm happy to take any questions about those things. I am a cis Pakiha bisexual woman, um, and I'm very proud to be part of this community and really happy that you're all here this evening to um, listen in and um, share with us. So thank you all for being here. Kilda, thank you. Uh, I should also say that part, a big part of my background has always been around health and well-being. I have specialised in the well-being of Takatapui and our rainbow community, so the focus on young people and uh, suicide prevention, violence prevention. So we know that all of those things wind together and, and the, the way that I look at health then is very much based on the whare tapawha model where we know that what is uh, our way to our, our spirituality and our interconnectedness with all things in the universe is, is inextricably connected with our tinana, our bodily integrity, with our whānau and uh, the, the families of our birth and of our choosing and our hinengaro, our psychological and our mental well-being. All of those things are connected. And so I think those are things we bring when we look at this law it's going to completely restructure our health system. How can we <laughs> get this done in style? How can we improve what they've got? How can we make them think about things a little bit differently? So since coming into parliament, I am the health spokesperson and I am on the health select committee. We're one of the busiest and most influential select committees in parliament. And with the passing of this legislation, a new select committee was formed, the Paiora Healthy Futures Legislation Select Committee, and I'm on that as well. So I get to have the meetings with the ministers, with the officials, and when I talk, I talk about Kopapa Māori and I talk about Takatapu and rainbow things. So a little bit later on, we'll talk about the priorities we've established as the Greens and what we've been arguing for and fighting for. But to start, I'll give you just a, a mini overview of the Act itself. So the number one thing the Act does is it disestablishes the existing health system, which is based around district health boards. So all of those gone. It replaces it with two structures. One, Health New Zealand. And that is the overview of, of the entire of the system and the Māori Health Authority, which is a uh, independent statutory authority. So it does not provide direct services. It oversees the procurement and funding to Māori providers, but it also has a monitoring, monitoring role over the uh, Health New Zealand. Because of course, if you're talking about Māori people and fixing the dis massive disparities, which we are seeing reinforced and happening because of COVID, uh, we know that we have to deal with the entire system because not all Māori are seen by Māori providers. Part of uh, the issue with DHBs being disestablished is those community boards are gone. And for a lot of that consumer voice then has been um, lost in that way. So the way that they're replacing that is with, uh, for the Māori side of things, uh, the Iwi Māori Partnership Boards. We looking forward to seeing how that rolls because at least at DHB there were multiple around the country we had established their relationships with them good or bad uneven and now there's there's going to be a bit more jostling jostling for position um, and how that works out it's not entirely clear how consumer voices will be heard 
in the space. Uh, so that might be something that people want to focus on is what is the clear mechanism. Uh, they're going to, and the other thing it does, two more things, one is around public health. They're disestablishing the public promotion, now what is it called now, the promotion agency, and replacing it with the health, public health agency. So this is quite important because this is the place where a health promotion, but also prevention. And if, if we want to make sure that things don't continue to be in the bad way that they are, especially in regards to our communities, then prevention is really, really important. And that means sinking resources into key areas. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Bridget. Health Promotion Agency. You'd think I don't know. <laughs> you think I haven't been going over these papers over and over. Thank you. So it, it gets a little frustrating when governments restructure over and over because it wasn't that long ago before that was restructured, um, it formed. And so we would like things to settle down and actually just do things well. The other thing it does is there's a whole pile of strategies and um, accountability monitoring systems. Zoe spoke about the fact that currently, yes, thank you, to heading a hauora. That was a new Māori word, new Māori title for the Health Promotion Agency. Uh, and I don't know, I haven't seen a Māori title for this new one, but that may well already exist. The as I said, the Māori, Pacifica and people with disabilities strategies are written into this. What we don't have is a rainbow strategy. So that is definitely one of the things that we'll be uh, asking for, because if they don't name us as, as a core uh, demographic in the provision of health, then we, we, we stay where we are, which is just really really piecemeal across the country and even when things are changed and they want to do use an equity lens uh, it's still going to be uneven because different places can't do everything and we still will have to travel and how they make that accessible is going to be a big big deal the one of their ideas is is to have what they're calling locality plans and so that means looking at health needs at local level and coming up with a plan for that. So instead of having a national thing where Wellington decides what's gonna happen and that gets dished out to the country, it'll be much more focused on what are the actual needs in that area. Uh, they're looking to create a, Māori, a New Zealand health charter, which identifies common values and principles. It is disturbing that such a thing does not really exist um, in our country. And they have a thing called the creating the code of consumer participation, and that'll support consumer participation and theoretically in some way allow voices to be heard. So we don't have all of the detail of how some of these things can work. The act puts pr makes provision for these to happen. So it's a very loose overview, uh, but there's kind of key areas where I think it's really, really important for us to focus in one, the strategy. Uh, two, consumer voices, three, pro promotion, and, and of course, there'll be others, depending on what is your personal experience. I'm going to pass to, now, I can see there are already some questions in the Q&A, rather than go into the chat, can you please put, oh, kia ora Al, I just saw Al Green is here, incredible person in this space. Um, Yes, so we have got a uh, submission guide and that's just been added into the chat. And now I'm, I'm fully distracted because I'm reading Al's questions. So I'm just gonna have a look and see what they say. <laughs> okay. Zoe's gonna talk next about what important things to write into the submission. Uh, Al's just raising the issue about that the new board of the Māori Health Authority doesn't get captured by the Whānau Order Commissioning Agency. Okay, 
I'm going to read this because this is a very interesting question. The agency board is, in my opinion, a brown elitist bureaucracy. What advice do we have about how we as Māori and Takatapui can make sure that the MHA is truly accountable to Māori and to Takatapui? So when, it, when you're addressing the section on the Māori Health Authority, then I would recommend that you actually spell it out. Who are the representatives? It's the same, same old people, uh, not necessarily people with extensive health backgrounds, um, who are the types of, of people, who are the types of Māori, who are the types of um, health professionals or community leaders that we want to see in those spaces. Uh, it's only if we can get a groundswell of support that these will change. Otherwise, it's very common when government sets up things that you see the same Māori appearing um, because they have those relationships So I'm going to pass to Zoe and <clears throat> talk about submissions. Cool, thank you, Elizabeth. Um, so with the um, submissions, the, um, the angle from a, um, from a rainbow lens is like Elizabeth said, is, is that subsection five to include a um, strategy for um, rainbow communities. Um, I also think it's really important for um, non-Maori, particularly in our community, particularly Pākehā, to also uplift the, um, the um, intention of the bill itself and to other communities, but especially Maori, um, that it, we should be supporting um, these changes. Um, uh, homophobia, transphobia, racism towards Maori are all cut from the same uh, colonial cloth um, and we do need to be um, uh, I think uplifting each other and recognizing those intersectionalities um, which is I know intersectionality is a bit of a buzzword but it's very I think it's very useful to think about in these situations so the best the best thing about writing submissions is um, it's just it's just a chance to actually just share your story I think people come in from a perspective of a submission that you have to be very technical, you have to have a lot of evidence, you have to be an expert in the, in the, um, in the subject, but realistically what you can bring to your the table is your own unique experience and your own unique knowledge. Um, and for us in the rainbow community, we, we actually have a wealth of knowledge and experience there where we have been through systems and seen our friends and our family members go through the system and be harmed by it greatly and it's it's it can be hard to share that story but those are actually the things that make a huge difference so my my advice is is to make it make it personal um and it can be it can be difficult um definitely um I definitely I think got into a place when I was writing on conversion therapies um you know because I was thinking about my connection to um, my religious background and things like that um, and I found myself in quite a place where I was like quite feeling like oh but um, it's it's immensely helpful to do so um, so the first sort of thing is um, when you sort of structure I'll talk about structuring it so it really helps us to say up front if you support the bill or not um, even if you support it in theory or in most of these support it with some some amendments that's important to stay up first of all because that will help frame the entire the um entire kind of um thing can i get a few could i get you to have a few words about your special oh cool oh was that a panelist question for me uh yeah um i will sorry i'm, I'm very i've just i've actually just been di um, diagnosed with adhd of, of through our health system so that's been that might give you an, an a um a uh, idea of what i've been um going through at the moment but um yes yeah, so the submission we've actually prepared a submission to the rainbow green so we're focusing on the big the big things that we're focusing on is entrenching um right entrenching titrity rights into the into this um bill making sure that we're really encourage we're really those are really strong and uh, those are upheld throughout everything in this health system and everything we do um another key th the key thing is i'm just going to pull up my notes that i made sorry oh i had it that was gone that's, that's okay um the other key thing is that that subsection five um stating the fact that we need these the this um this strategy to be made um big areas are um obviously looking at Things like um, sexual health is a big one for the rainbow community. Um, gender, re gender um, aff access to gender affirming society. 
sorry, gender affirming um, surgeries, um, also um, removing um, uh, intersex surgery or intersex communities as well. So there's a lot of different areas you can look into. Um, and there's a lot of different, if you are particularly well versed in one area or you know from experience, then it's, you can focus in on those. Um, that's just kind of some of the, the issues that we've started to talk about. Um, I'm sure I've missed, I've maybe missed a couple there. So apologies if I, if I have. Um, we also kind of talked about um, access to, yeah, textual health, covered that. Um, and yeah, just access to uh, gender affirming care, which is um, actually, I think Lane probably could speak to that as well, since that's your study area. Um, but yeah, like those are the things that we've looked at and that you can look to include in your submission. Um, but anything else that you've experienced as a rainbow um, in as a um, in a person in the rainbow community is valid in this bill, I think, um, because it is a very broad bill where we can actually you know, start putting the planting these seeds in, in the minds of MPs and and ministry workers and making sure that these ideas are brought to the table. Um, yeah, hopefully that made sense. Sorry, I kind of lost my I lost my um, my train of thought, but um, um, I. Yeah, I'll leave it there and um, see if there's any, anyone's got any questions. Kia ora. Thank you, Zoe. Uh, one thing I would add to that is just to make sure that you stay very early on in your submission that you want to make an oral submission, that you want to be heard. Now, you can change your mind later, but it's really important for us to get as many voices as we can. What we've seen in the submissions that are coming through already is that a lot of racist people, why should we have a separate Māori Health Authority? It's racist. Uh, we're going to probably have another fresh onslaught from the anti-trans people. Uh, so that those negative voices will be very coordinated and organized. So as many of us as can get uh, submission done, it can be quite short. Um, but still make sure it's a good couple of paragraphs to be considered. Um, and it's really, really important to write something unique. Do not cut and paste someone else's submission. Uh, absolutely say, yes, we submit, we support the uh, submission by Rainbow Greens. We support the submission from Tengako Kahukura. Uh, but write something that's yours because if you have cut and pasted someone else's that just gets counted along with theirs and you don't get a simple um yeah you don't get counted you don't get to speak so as many voices and just want to reiterate what Zoe said is to share your personal story why is this important to you because we get hundreds we get thousands and thousands of written submissions and we get hundreds and hundreds of of oral submissions so the ones that we remember as MPs uh, are the personal ones don't need to spill your guts but you know tell a story that you feel comfortable to share and you can also submit anonymously or secretly you don't have to be on the you know live streaming or Facebook uh, submissions here in the hearing so just keep that in mind uh, oh this is a really good question do you want to take this one uh, Zoe we're coming to you next lane but I just something's popped up about submissions can you see that? Yeah, just really quickly, I saw someone said, will my submission be taken more seriously if I try and write it in formal language? Um, not necessarily, actually. Um, you don't necessarily have to be, I think it's more thinking about persuasive writing rather than formal writing. So if it's a, I, I find it's best to speak in a language that you're most comfortable in. Um, I've seen some great submissions that are really quite casually written. And I think that um, it's, it's and other, other submissions um, are quite formal. Um, and I think it's whatever works for you in your natural style. So you might be a more formal writer, and if that's comfortable for you, then I think go for it. If you're someone who is more casual, um, then who has a more casual tone, then I think go for go for that tone because at the end of the day, it's your voice that comes that comes through, and you don't have to be you know using the thesaurus and being like, oh, that's not a really fancy word, or I'm not sure if that's the right term. Um, because yeah. It, you want to connect it back to yourself um, and your community. So definitely whatever you feel comfortable with. Um, and, it, and yeah, like, like Elizabeth said, making sure you, if you are comfortable doing an oral submission as well, it makes it easier to do an oral submission if you've written it in a language that you're comfortable speaking in because it'll help, it'll help you flow, your ideas flow on and you won't have a page of writing where you're like, oh, I can't remember writing this. It's so formal and, you know, whatever. Um, yeah, it helps, to, it helps to write in a language you're comfortable with, I would say. 
Hopefully that's your question. Awesome. I'm going to hand over to Lane and maybe you might also like to take, there's a couple of health related questions in here that you might want to address. Yes, all good. I see the first question I see is right up my alley. Should, um, by, I'm from Harrison, should training for health professionals on rainbow health care also be concluded? Absolutely. Um, that, um, I think that feeds right into our first point about making sure that there is a rainbow strategy um, because to be able to have providing um, healthcare for our rainbow communities, you know, everyone needs to be trained across the board, no matter what point of healthcare in, in the system that you enter, you touch from primary to tertiary, everyone should be competent in treating everyone with respect and dignity. Um, and a, a bit of um, insight from my experience in medicine in med school was that even when we have delivered some spaces where there is training around rainbow issues, staff isn't trained to teach it. So we have a few tutorials in our second year um, talking about LGBTQIA plus and Takatapui uh, communities, just by understanding the basic stuff. Um, and none of the tutors um, had any training about this. So you walk into your tutorial room and the tutor says, I don't know much about this, but we'll figure it out together. And so what way does that communicate to our, um, our learning doctors that this is actually important? Um, and if you are discussing, you know, the nuances of the difference between gender and sex, sex characteristic um, and sexuality, and, you know, the, the tutor doesn't know, um, if you yourself are a rainbow person, are in that classroom, you have to, I, you have to decide if you're going to out yourself and teach your class which I chose to do because there were some very marginal things being said and I wanted to make sure that everyone in the room was on the right page. Or you have to sit there and be in the presence of wrong stuff being taught. So um, yeah, so I, I would love to see that be put in there. Um, like currently, at least at Otago, I'm pretty sure it's the same at Auckland. There isn't anyone, no staff members that are paid to do this sort of work to manage rainbow issues. So like the only work that is being done by the real champions in um, rainbow um, health who are actually doing this, who may be Otago University employees, but are doing this out of their own spare time, out of their own like spare bit of pay time that they have, but it isn't actually part of their job description. Um, so that would be, I think, a really important part of um, going forward. Yeah. Um, answer that. Oh, yeah. Um, so what other questions do we have? Uh, removing genderized barriers for healthcare. Yes, I've, I've heard much about this, about the computer systems. Um, yeah, pregnancy tests can only be ordered by people designated as women. Um, yes, cervical smears, prostate exams, all of that are very gendered. Um, and it's on a, um, from what I understand, because of how everything is on a DHB, DHB basis, um, that only, every, everywhere uses a different system. Some, some places share a system, um, but that makes it more challenging for, you know, sharing health information if you happen to be on holiday somewhere and um, they don't use the same system. They have to contact DHBs to get your records. Um, like, so I, I hope to see in this change that there is a universal system used throughout all of healthcare and that will be a uh, removing genderized barriers and that would be a, a great thing to include somewhere. Okay, cool. Maybe you take a break. Yeah. And <laughs> I'll just, I'll, I'll take a reading break on the quiz. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. The, um, the data systems are really, really important to address. We see what's happening right now with uh, people's preferred gender markers and names uh, not being correct in the NHI system and that having a flow on into the vaccine passes and then this is just a, a, a symptom of what has been going on for quite some time. Uh, we saw just recently with the passing of the bill which allows um, cervical cancer screening to be updated that in the system if you unless you were designated as female in the system you didn't even you could not get screening full stop for anybody who um, has a vagina or a vulva 
and that's just insane. So that's just not appropriate. Let's see, I'm going to actually acknowledge that there are several leaders amongst the people in our uh, in our pan in our hui in our Zoom tonight. And so I would like to ask a couple of them who are preparing submissions to come and have a quick word and we can um, yeah, just highlight some of the things that you're working on in your submission and that you maybe would like to share with the rest of us. I'm going to start with uh, Moira Clooney from Te, Ra Te Ngākau Kahukura. And I see that Mani that you're here, don't need to put you on the spot, but if if you wanted to mention what ITANS is uh, wanting to put, if you're doing a submission, uh, then you're, I'm really, really happy for, for you or another representative from my tends to speak. Kia ora Moira. <laughs> this was not okay, planned. <laughs> Just to jump in on your webinar, um, kia ora, yeah, kia ora koutou, kia ora Elizabeth, thank you so much for having me on. Um, ko moira koini toka ingoa, he uri tēnei no te raroa, ko ngai te poti ki motu karaka te hapu. Um, so, whakapapa to the Hokianga and to Scotland, England, Ireland and Orkney on the other side of the world. Um, and I'm project lead for Tingako Kahukura. So we're a national initiative that's about trying to create an Aotearoa where rainbow people grow up feeling safe, feeling accepted, feeling like they belong and have a place in all of the aspects of their life, wherever they live, learn, work, access healthcare and social support. Um, so this is a really key one, I guess, for us in terms of um, looking at what what's needed in the health system. And I think um, in terms of our submission, um, we're mainly calling for one thing, which is a rainbow health strategy, which um, has already been mentioned by Rainbow Greens whānau, um, and just specifying particularly that includes provision of um, gender affirming healthcare and needs to include progress around developing a rights-based um, health protocol, health services for intersex people, as well as workforce development, generally across the healthcare system. I feel like if there's a rainbow health strategy that really flows through into everything else, so that would require that there are staff that are named in the health in um, Health New Zealand and in the Māori Health Authority who um, have a job to look at takatapui and rainbow health, um, and that it would flow through into funding and systems and strategies and action plans at every level. So I think that the strategy is a really key thing. But um, then I think too, the big thing our submission is focusing on is really making the case for why rainbow populations need a strategy. Um, I guess my experience advocating around similar things, thinking about the Mental Health and Wellbeing Commission bill, is that oftentimes um, if we say, make sure you include rainbow um, and takatapui people in your plan, um, a very common response, especially from the health system, is, well, yes, of course, we understand that rainbow populations have their own needs, but so do lots of populations, actually. And if you included rainbow, you'd need to include refugees and prisoners and men and X, Y, Z population, and which is true. I mean, all every population has their own needs and, and um, you know, needs to have, have responses, um, have a responsive health system. But I guess why I would see rainbow populations being at that level of needing a specific strategy that is ongoing in perpetuity is that as well as having, you know, we've got inequitable health outcomes across mental health, across sexual health, across lots of different areas um, and inequitable experiences of the healthcare system. So lots of us can speak to the health system being discriminatory and unhelpful. There's also a specific history of pathologization within the healthcare system. So um, in terms of our identities, you know, it was only sort of in the 70s and then not really until the 2000s that um, that homosexuality was declassified as a mental illness. And that's only much more recent for trans people. That process is really still ongoing. It was only, um, was it three or four years ago that the that um, gender identity disorder was taken out of the international classification of diseases. Um, and in terms of the understandings of intersex people within the healthcare system, that is still heavily pathologized. And so like there's a there's a thinking and learning process that the health system needs to go through that they haven't ever really been supported to go through. So there's a particular 
chunk of work there <laughs> that we need a strategy around, but then also there's specific health needs that aren't being addressed well in our current health system. And so I'm particularly thinking around gender affirming healthcare and around intersex health, but um, we could also speak to sexual health, to um, reproductive um, equity and to mental health amongst other things. So um, yeah, that's a bit of an overview of what we're talking about. Kilda. Thank you, Moira. And I'm going to pass over to the legendary Marnie Mitchell. I'm caught on the hop here. So I, <laughs> I want to support everything that Moira has said um, and encourage people to write those personal narratives. So I think one of the biggest things that we need to do and to address is pulling into the curriculum and training programs, um, a, a program that does address um, implicit bias. Now, we have actually run, um, and Lane, I look forward to talking to you about that, a, a program under the ethics module um, with all level five students. And we've been doing that for six years. So I'm excited about the people that are coming forward into medicine because they're very different than when we first started this work. So relating to what Moira has just said, that the whole um, conceptual way of, of being with our community and supporting our well-being and healthcare needs to fundamentally change. Until that happens, um, our healthcare is at a Māori level and then the rainbow community and, and as we say it's an intersectional space will not be addressed so I think we need to be doing two things um, the, the big more technical submission but I'm just going to encourage everybody who's listening tonight to write those personal stories you know um, the good if they exist and then the, the not good and and if you write a not good story um, I would encourage you at the end of it to tell them what it would look like to be good and I just say that because a number of years ago I was um, in a hui in, in America and sat with intersex youth you know and, and we'd spent the, the day before in tears with these terrible stories and then we worked out what could we do differently. So these incredible people went in front of doctors and they did role play. And their first one was, you know, the shit horrible story of what had happened that was so awful. And then they hit pause button and they looked these doctors in the eyes and said, this is what you need to do to look after us well. And it's so powerful. And I think that's what might shift the bar. So... Um, thank you, Elizabeth, for creating this hui um, and, and for really uplifting people to um, consider every single voice here tonight is valuable and this is what will shift um, the bar. So thank you for this opportunity to speak. Kia ora. And of course, unrehearsed and, and <laughs> totally on the fly. Uh, I want to come back to a question that Al has added in here about the bill requires members of the Māori Health Authority Board and the Iwi Māori Partnership Board to collectively have experience and knowledge of mātauranga Māori and tikanga Māori. How will we, the Takatāpu community, ensure that, that tikanga Māori includes that historical respect and acceptance of Takatāpu, uh, but support for us as in, important members of Fano. How do we make sure that is followed? What mechanisms are there to ensure these boards employ tikanga Māori? My, my personal solution to this, and this is what I've suggested to the minister and to all the officials, is that there needs to be a rainbow unit inside Health New Zealand and there needs to be a takatāpu unit inside the Māori Health Authority. People who are responsible for the overview of what that looks like nationally and that that we should specify that representation on those boards. So again, if that's something that's important to you, add that into the submission, because one of the things is when the, uh, the officials break down all of the submissions, they go through every single one in detail, they pull out what the issues are now that have been mentioned. So it doesn't matter if your issue is mentioned a thousand times 
or one time it is captured. And so any random, you know, sometimes it might think, oh, it's a random thing. I don't know about this. Put it down because it will be captured and it will be seen and we will discuss it and say, right, does this thing that needs to happen, will the bill allow it to? Because so long as the bill doesn't stop it happening, we can still fight for it to happen. We have to make sure some of it is actually opening space to do what we need to do and making sure it's not shut down. Uh, so, and also it's lobbying when those points come up to say who's going to nominate people into boards, who has, who makes that decision. Some of that comes past us as MPs and some of it doesn't. So that's incumbent on us as well to say, right, who are your takataupi people to challenge the composition of those boards? So it's the level that you can participate in. That's where we try and have the influence. So for your submission, absolutely say those things. These are the criteria. We need people in there who represent our communities and have a say in them. Um, I saw another, if you've got a question, um, could you put it into the Q&A? It's just easier for us to read it and see it then in the chat. Cool. We have got a little lull. And so I'm going to... Um, Is it time for some blether? <laughs> yeah, I'm coming to you, Zoe. <laughs> I'm always up for it. Um, yeah, I think I'll talk maybe about um, about making oral submission because um, I wanted to offer because um, I know it can be really it can be really daunting making an oral submission, especially I think as rainbow communities, and I think especially um, if you're you know if if you have if you've if you've, if you've heard some of the submitters, it's quite it can be quite a weird toxic environment to submit to um and if you're wanting to make an oral submission but you feel like you don't have the confidence to then um please feel free to email me and um what i'll what i'd like to do is um i'm i basically exist in this community to be a big cheerleader for everyone so um if you want me to if you want to um message me before or after your submission just to get like some like some um like just a bit of support and a bit of like yeah you can do it and just like talk through it and like get some little 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 speaking tips um then yeah i'll just drop my email into the chat and then yeah feel free to email me um also my um lovely pal uh role is also offered to support as well um and Ro uh, role is a, a wonderful um uh supporter also so they will they'll be also help um offering to help so if you are making oral submission then yeah please feel free and even i write a written submission if you want like a a, a second pass at it then i'm happy to do that so um yeah and um oh another another thing as well sorry i just remembered um if you want to make a submission as a group mm. there's no like official like official um like they're not going to check if you're an official like registered company or organization or non-profit it's literally just five or more people so if you have like five mates and yourself together you are a group and you can make a, a 10 minute submission, um, which if you've got specific issues that you really want to outline in five minutes isn't enough and often it, it isn't, um, then you can uh, use that tactically to give yourself some more um, some more speaking time. And also you go first as well, um, I believe in the submission order. So that can actually be a really, um, it's quite, it can be quite a bit of a tactical game. So, um, and unfortunately um, the, some of the uh, right wing organizations and right wing people play it quite well, but it doesn't mean we don't have to, we can don't have to be lagging behind. So yeah, you can be, you know, local, your town community rainbow group or something like that, you know, or just whatever name you like really. This is really important because it's true. We hear from organizations first in the submissions and they're given more time and more weight. And so it can be an informal group. It could be your research project. So absolutely take that uh, opportunity uh, to do that. Uh, there is, I just want to acknowledge a comment in the chat that it's really important when you identify the kind of issues that you are aware of, that you've experienced personally, or you're aware of happening to other people in the community or your whanau, to, um, to really specify what's needed. So the example that's given here that sometimes uh, funding might be leveraged 
ostensibly for trans and uh, trans healthcare, but then it's used for a broader rainbow thing, which means it isn't actually used for trans um, gender affirming healthcare. So I think really specific details like that to say if there's a strategy it needs to include specific areas that will be worked on and the funding allocated for that and that's why the strategy is actually really key it's really really key because it provides as as moira said it provides that framework uh, for everything that flows on from that the refusal to have one so far uh, is is quite disturbing and we need to challenge that now I'm noticing, and I want to do a shout out, we've got Rainbow Greens from Zoe and Rosemary and other people who are here on the call, but we also have people here from Inclusive Greens. And this is our people who represent people with disabilities. Uh, and I'm just throwing it out there. If you would like to have, uh, to contribute to the corridor now, uh, then make a, make a comment in the chat and Sean will bring you in because, I think we just have to really acknowledge that many people who are rainbow, many people who are Māori also have disabilities. And we, um, we are never just one thing. We experience all the things. And so, let's see. Kia ora, Gordon. Sean, could you bring Gordon in? Really appreciate everybody just, you know, stepping up like this. <laughs> no, my. Go for it, Gordon. Kia ora whanau. Um, this is somewhat unexpected. Um, but yeah, I guess I just want to reiterate what Elizabeth was just saying. Um, I myself identify as a disabled person. Um, I live with cerebral palsy and have for the last 35 years and will for the rest of my life. It is a disability that will not go away. Um, I also identify as a rainbow person, as a cis, gay, white male, and also want to acknowledge that being cis and white does also give me some privilege um, but what I do want to say is um, you know in the in the in the sphere that um, if you look at rainbow health and disabled health quite often um, people who are disabled are marginalized for even having a relationship um, and when it comes to their health care, we are often reluctant to um, mention that we're in a relationship because if you live on supported living, like many in the disabled community do, or any other such benefit, it can um, impair what your entitlements may be from um, work and income. Um, it it is a scary place to be if um, you are both rainbow and disabled. And it also means that if you are disabled or on, um, what do they call it now, um, supported living, um, which I will acknowledge I have been on for the past 30 plus years and, and extremely privileged now, and it's only been since the August lockdown to be working pretty much full time and be completely off benefit. So just want to acknowledge my privilege in that respect. But if you are relying on that benefit every year, if you are on supported living, you have to go and prove to a WINS appointed doctor that you are still disabled. Um, no matter um, if you've been in my situation where you have a disability, that is lifelong, that is not going to go away. You are required to do that every 12 months. And of course, they ask questions about what is your, you know, do you have a partner? Do you flat? Do you, you know, what is your situation? And if you are someone who has been flatting or 
living with other people and you've ended up in a relationship with someone in that in that household you're not going to want to disclose that to a doctor who you may only be meeting for the very first time who has to make a snap decision on whether you're eligible for any sort of benefit now bear in mind this is a person who you do not they are not your regular GP and my argument has always been that your regular GP knows you best knows your situation they should be able to confirm every 12 months or every three years whatever the heck um MSD determine what your health situation is. Um, as I say, I completely support um, the call and doing submissions. I haven't actually thought about doing one as yet myself. That may change through the course of this call. Um, thank you so much, for Elizabeth, for um, allowing me to speak. And thank you to everyone who has spoken so far. And also just really want to acknowledge um, Kerry Locker Lampton and Phil, thank you for the sign language interpretation. Rookie mistake. <laughs> I'll forgive you. Kilda, thank you. Um, thank you, Gordon. That was lovely. I wanted to um, bring it back. We've got five minutes. I'm going to quickly respond to Al. So prolific with the questions. Love it. Uh, and just noticing the Ministry of Health has never evaluated its policy. They're going to have to create all new policy. So I think it's really important in your submission to say, hey, let's have an overall strategy. And here's some key policies you need to create. Uh, and, and just having heard from Gordon, it reminded me that one of the things, the objective of Health New Zealand, and I quote, is to encourage and maintain community participation in health improvement and service planning, to promote health and prevent, reduce and delay ill health, including by collaborating with other social sector agencies to address the determinants of health. Now we know that there's so many things that impact on us when we look at health in any kind of um, integrated holistic way so feel free to use this opportunity to say this is what MSD is doing that it's impacting on my health this is what's happening in housing this is what's happening in, in, in any area that's actually impacting on you which is another agency because we need to absolutely leverage and hold them accountable to that statement because of course they cannot do everything by themselves. They must work with the other agencies, but this government struggles to do that. And I'm very, yeah, it's take the opportunity, have a rave, do at least five, couple of paragraphs, five sentences at least, position yourself, say why you care, use whatever privilege that you have for those of us who assist, for those of us who are um, endosex, for those of us who are Pākehā, use that opportunity to up, uplift the other more marginalised parts of our community and either mention their submissions and say you sub support the recommendations in them. You can cut and paste some things out of that. Do not copy everything from anybody write something that's authentic and genuine it's better to have something that's short that's genuine and it's from you that's finished and submitted then a beautiful essay that never gets done we just want the more voices the better the more issues the better and in the spirit i'm going to double check in the two minutes we have left okay uh, Jasper has asked, can they keep in touch with someone to help them out with specifics for their submission? Zoe has uh, put their contact details into the chat. And so uh, that is um, somebody, and if anybody else here is keen to have some one-on-one -on -one advice, then uh, go for it. Thank you so much, Zoe. It's a big deal. So finally, want to... Thank everybody for coming. We promise it's an hour. We're going to keep to that. I want to thank our panelists, Zoe and Lane and 
impromptu panelists, <laughs> Moira, Mani and Gordon, uh, for coming to us tonight. Just uh, for those of us who are in this world to create change, this is another way of doing it. And let's, let's create some space for us and move in and make that space bigger and better as much as we can. I like to finish hui uh, with whakatauki <laughs> and one of my favorites. It's very short, but I, it's, it's, I think it captures a lot. And yeah, ma pango, ma whero, ka oti ai te mahi, with the red and with the black, with our combined knowledge, our combined effort, our passion, our belief and our vision, we will get the work done. Kia ora koutou, thank you. Enjoy the rest of your night.